We've got $330 trillion industry here, which arguably a lot of it's at risk, right? We talk about stranded assets, creme pathways to stranded assets, etc. I talk to a lot of funds. I've talked to a lot of developers. They're getting very worried about this, right? And it's not just about their existing portfolios. It's about how are they going to exit portfolios? Because a lot of buyers now actually build in the cost of retrofitting a, a building to bring it up to sustainability when they're looking at acquiring an asset. So that might bring the price down. For us, we look at everything you've just mentioned. We look at materials, we look at hardware, we look at software, anything that gets us to some of these impact targets we want to achieve in the built environment and also is something which is commercially viable and, and fixes some particular pain point within this ecosystem. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the premier podcast dedicated to dissecting the pulse of business technology and media in Asia. I'm Bernard Leung. And how does one invest in a sustainable future for the built environment and make an impact on humanity for the next few decades? With me today is Alexander Bent, managing partner and founder of Undivided Ventures from Hong Kong. Alexander, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bernard. Good to be here. I enjoyed that conversation we have in March together with Ariel and Austin. And we really talk about the future of tech and how you're thinking about investing in the built environment. So I decided that I must get you on here to have this conversation with me. As per always, I'd like to start by asking my guests on their origin story. How did you start your career and eventually land your current role as the founder of Undivided Ventures? So I was always a very frustrated entrepreneur, even at university. I wanted to get out into the world and, and do something. But I started my career at Swire many years ago. And you know, in 2003, I came back to Hong Kong from the United States because that's where I was working for Swire at the time. And it was, you know, Hong Kong was going through the Asia financial crisis. We had another pandemic, SARS. So property prices were an, an all-time low. I didn't really have any perspective, but I knew that things were cheap. So I started buying small units around Hong Kong and basically renovating them and, and renting them out. Because in Hong Kong at the time, what you had is uh, people who usually came with families. So, so they would usually come to Hong Kong for work with families. That was changing. That demographic was changing to, to singles between the age of 25 and 35. So that was a huge opportunity for renting flexible accommodation. So that's what I got into. And then with my previous business partner, we built essentially a platform of about 23 apartments around Hong Kong, took that to a family office and started buying buildings when I was 28 years old. I didn't, didn't have a clue about buying buildings, but we started buying them anyway and basically wrapping the same concept that we had been doing with individual apartments around buildings. And it was far more efficient, right? Because you, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're not running around town trying to clean multiple apartments. You're cleaning one asset. So anyway, we built up a service department platform in from 2006 to 2011. And we sold that in 2011 to another group called Overlo Hospitality, which operates in, in, in Hong Kong and throughout Asia and, and Australia. And off the back of that, you know, we built what's called, I suppose, an asset management company called District 15. And we started working with institutions. And those institutions included folks like Schroeder's, Angelo Gordon, so big real estate funds from US and, and Europe. And you know, our, our investment thesis, I suppose, was pretty simple back in the day, which is really what drives people to choose space. And from our perspective, that was design. So, you know, if you build nicer places to live, work, and shop, chances are you're going to get better quality tenants. You're going to get an uplift in rent and the stickiness with your, with your tenancies is going to be there. And, you know, today this sounds very obvious, but back then in an Asian context, you know, Asian developers are very price sensitive. They don't want to invest a lot into design. And until they saw value, you know, there wasn't a huge amount of interest, but I think we showed that there was value in that. And, and so, you know, that, that strategy worked very well. In 2012, 2013, I started to introduce this idea of the environment, quote unquote, being a, another pillar of, of that investment thesis, but no one was interested. I mean, if you cast your mind back to that time, again, in an Asian context, people thought the sustainability was about building a green wall. In fact, in Hong Kong, the building department offered additional GFA if you built a green wall. There was no sort of measurable impact. 
And so my LPs didn't really get it, and and we didn't really move forward with that initiative. But if you if you move forward to about 2019, 2020, when I was still running my previous business, you know, I I started to get a a, a lot of ESG checklists, and the usual way of bringing a building up to sustainability standard was to essentially get an Arup or an ACOM to go in and do an audit. And, and you know, those folks have a huge amount of use when it comes to climate adaptation for buildings. But I, I also think that there needs to be a component of technology in there because if you're a real estate uh, institution or a large developer, you want to get to, uh, you know, 2035 carbon neutral targets, that's going to be very, very difficult with just using consultants alone. So innovation technology needs to be a layer on top of that. And so I started investing in, you know, sustainable technologies for the built environment alongside a gentleman called Dr. Tim Foreman from Cambridge University and also Ariel Stockman, who you know. And, uh, you know, we, we, we're now a team of eight and we're investing across, across Asia and Europe. Mm. You did mention the climate adaptation. So is the way you're thinking about investment in this space is actually thinking through not just climate mitigation, but also climate adaptation, because this is very rare. I usually hear investors always going for climate mitigation. Yeah. I mean, if you're investing in the built environment, you know, 70% of the buildings we see today will be around for a long time, right? So you need to think about uh, not just mitigation, but adaptation. And especially in the context of you know, what, you, what you've seen, you know, in Hong Kong and, and throughout Asia, which is vastly different weather patterns. We were speaking to an insurance company the other day who is very concerned about existing stock of assets and whether they're really up to the task. Part of what we look at and what we invest in is, is technologies that can help these buildings adapt. And I think that that's, you know, that's very, very important in the context of, of, of real estate infrastructure, et cetera. Alex, you came from a very interesting career. You started working as an entrepreneur, doing asset management, and now being an investor. For some of my audience out there, what are the key lessons that you can share about your career journey with my audience? Yeah, that's there's a lot. I think that, you know, what, what, quite honestly, I think one of the, the, the things that people don't realize about, I suppose, being an entrepreneur sometimes is that you know, and, and this was a lesson I learned from a very successful entrepreneur that I talked about years ago. He said, there's no glamour in being an entrepreneur. And it really is true because if you want to start something, you have to get involved in every aspect of that business, right down to the nitty gritty initially. You know, it's not until you really become on someone like Elon Musk's level that that glamour is just 24 seven. I think that even for Elon Musk, I'm sure, you know, hats off to him. He's he's really understood that he really needs to understand the business. And I think that that's very important. And, and actually, Swire, when I was working for Swire, taught me a very, very valuable lesson. When I went in and did their management trainee program, I, I was putting bottles on shelves in supermarkets in Utah. And, you know, it's like that. I mean, I think I'm old enough now. I, I'm sure you're much younger than me, Bernard. But, I, you know, Karate Kid, where you got that scene with Mr. Miyaki, where he talks about wax on, wax off. You don't really know why you're doing it, but you're doing it. And, and you know, putting balls on shelves in supermarkets taught me a lot about inventory management, taught me about what sells, what doesn't sell, where you put the bottle. So that's all about sort of, you know, customer acquisition, customer demand. And I think that, you know, one of the lessons I've learned is just be humble. Because if you're humble, then, you know, at least you can learn, you know, and you should be learning every day and, and also not have an ego. I mean, I think that that's, that's key. We will, you know, being an entrepreneur, you get uh, a lot of rejection. There's some great times, but there's also people who don't share your vision, right? And you just have to, you just have to keep going. Mm. Which comes to the main subject of the day. I want to talk to you about undivided ventures and also how thinking about investing in a sustainable future for the built environment, something that in my past life, as I just passed, has gone through as well. But maybe to start off, can you share the vision, mission for Undivided Ventures and why the focus on built environment? So when I had my own portfolio of assets with District 15, I and I started to read up a lot about the impact of the built environment, so specifically in my case, the real estate industry and construction industry and what that impact was on on the wider community and environment, you know, I thought about numbers, right? And I thought about scale. And and I looked at my portfolio and I said, listen, I can help you know, actually have an effect on my portfolio, but it's relatively small. I'm a, I'm a boutique developer. So 
if I want to have a measurable impact at scale, which is what I think needs to happen in 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 the real estate and infrastructure space, then I need to you know invest in technologies that can adapt across many different portfolios and many different construction companies and many different infrastructure players. And so Undivided came about because we had a vision for really doing what I suppose, and I'm sorry to bring him up again, but what Elon Musk has done for mobility, right? Elon Musk has put mobility on the map. And I think the built environment, there's a real climate tech mismatch. You've got the built environment, which, which contributes arguably 40% of all G- GHG emissions globally. And it only gets about 4% of total VC funding, as an example. Mobility, on the other hand, gets the bulk of VC funding in this space, but contributes arguably about 16, 17% of all GHG emissions. So if we want to do something, we have to focus on on you know one of the biggest culprits, which is which is this space. And I also think that if you if you don't have background in real estate construction, it's very difficult to invest mm. in in what works and also bring these technologies to market. So for me, with my background in real estate, that that seemed like a logical place to start. I agree with you on having that background in real estate. And it's only until I go into construction and really looking at some of the specific problems and then realize that things that happen, say, in semiconductor mobility, where you can do modular, it is actually very hard to pull off unless you were doing maybe straight lace condominiums or et cetera. How would you visualize that this total market opportunity in the landscape you invest in, it is specifically more towards the built environment from the sense of, say, the material side, the engineering side, or even other forms of uh, people called prop tech as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's all of the above, right? I mean, I think this is an incredible market opportunity. So forget about the impact for a second. If you're just looking at a commercial opportunity, I think this is massive. We've got $330 trillion industry here, which arguably a lot of it's at risk, right? We talk about stranded assets, creme pathways to stranded assets, et cetera. I talk to a lot of funds. I've talked to a lot of developers. They're getting very worried about this, right? And it's not just about their existing portfolios. It's about how are they going to exit portfolios? Because a lot of buyers now actually build in the cost of retrofitting a, a building to bring it up to sustainability when they're looking at acquiring an asset. So that might bring the price down. For us, we look at everything you've just mentioned. We look at materials, we look at hardware, we look at software, anything that gets us to some of these impact targets we want to achieve in the built environment and also is something which is commercially viable and, and fixes some particular pain point within this ecosystem. Mm. Maybe you want to talk a little bit more specific into the investment thesis for Undivided Ventures. What falls and does not fall under your investment mandate for your venture firm? So if you look outside your window, Bernard, anything that doesn't mm-hmm. move, anything that doesn't move, <laughs> we will invest in a solution for that, which makes it more sustainable. I mean, that's really how to think about it. You know, everyone, a lot of people come to me and they're like, oh, you're very specific in your thematic. And actually, it's very, very broad. I mean, I think that the built environment encompasses roads, it encompasses lampposts, you know, obviously looks at, at, at real estate assets and the construction space. But we're, we're looking at a whole gamut of, of, of solutions because I think that just like sustainability, it's all interconnected. A lot of people talk about decarbonization. That's great. And, and we need to decarbonize. But that's just one mm-hmm. element of sustainability. We, we, so for us, we have five investment themes. We have decarbonization, we have climate adaptation, we have nature positive, we have circularity and resource efficiency, and then finally we have social value. And the reason why we went for these five investment themes is because we believe combined, that's where we're going to get the biggest impact from multiple different areas. And you're also global because I spoke to some of the companies that you invest in. It's not just limited to Hong Kong, but also everywhere else in the world, right? Yes, we focus on basically Europe and and Asia. When we invest in a company, we have three requirements. One, they need to be able to expand into Asia markets. That's very important for us. If they can't expand to Asia markets or they don't have any desire to, then we likely will pass. 
two, they need to be accretive to a construction company or a real estate developer's bottom line. And we'll come to that later and to why that's why that's important. And three, obviously, they need to meet, meet our own impact requirements. And And sometimes we do invest in companies that don't have the ability to articulate what those impacts are. For me, I think sustainability is a lot about efficiency, right? And, and, and if a company can demonstrate it's efficient in a particular area, we actually sometimes help them get to where they should be targeting in terms of some of those impact criteria. So this is one of my favorite questions. What's the typical day like for you as a venture capitalist? So I was in the real estate industry for a long time and the real estate industry moves very slowly. You know, I love real estate and love investing in real estate, but it's a very slow moving industry, right? Venture capital is completely different. Usually I'll get up at seven o'clock, I'll 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 do some exercise. That's important for me to clear my head. And then I get stuck in and I'm working pretty much the whole day. We we are currently also fundraising as well. So, you know, fundraising takes up a lot of time, especially in this environment. We are looking at deals and we have a really healthy pipeline right now because Undivided is now becoming a bit more of a brand and, and a bit more of a honeypot for, for for deals. So that's really exciting. And and then you know we're we're obviously running a company right we're making sure that everyone is on on in our team is has got a direction and and understands what to do but it is very busy and I think the other element to you know venture capital is networking I think unlike any other industry it's about making those connections making those connections between companies and industry making the connections internally in industry understanding some of the pain points so we do a lot of research papers on or white papers on on different areas of the built environment so yeah it's it's a pretty fulfilled day Bernard and 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 pretty 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 busy at times but super exciting and I think also the way that Asia is changing right now and that's really where I operate is is, is we're on the cusp of a real I think big change as far as sustainability is concerned you have really talked about how you identify and you evaluate potential investments in for the built environment specifically that for example the ability to expand into Asia but I want to be much more granular and go into say the traits of startup founders and their founding team what is it that will help you in making the decision to invest into them then so I think anyone in the VC world will talk to you about people, right? I think when you're talking mm. about sustainability, people become even more important because it's actually quite a challenge. You know, there are many sustainability solutions out there that are built by very technical individuals who have been working on it for for a long time, but don't necessarily have a huge amount of commercial exposure or expertise. So in an ideal world, you want to look for that founder that understands technical, that understands how to get to market, that understands distribution, all of that stuff. But, you know, they're like a unicorn sometimes. So so you you really have to then focus on grit, I think, and and trying to understand whether if they're a technical founder who's been building a decarbonization solution for the last five years, as an example, do they we can help them with some of the commercials but do they have the grit to move this forward and and i think that that for me is very very important it's very difficult to underwrite that i think that comes with experience it comes with failures right investing in in either the wrong company or the wrong people but also it comes with your own experience and i think again for for me having been an entrepreneur for a long time i think i understand what that grit looks like and 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 you know what that humility looks like too and i think that that's that's also quite important. In some case, for the built environment, it's a bit challenging. Like you said, right? Some people are very technologically inclined. They focus a lot on trying to build the right solution, you know, trying to focus on the technical solution, but they don't try to address the market. So what are the kind of business models that you think for startups to generate revenue in the area you invest in? I mean, the other question is, which is a corollary to this, would be how do you know that if the startup is on the right track or in building the correct monetization model because this industry is extremely slow. Being a main contractor when I was in Warhub is the same situation, you know, the way things process, the the business dynamics is very, very slow. Yeah, I mean, it's as, as we just talked about how slow the industry is in many respects. I do think that's changing, however, and I think that, you know, you and I have had a lot of experience looking at prop tech. I think that I would argue that there's never been a better time to digitize real estate and, and construction processes, and, and that's happening a lot more easily than it was maybe five years ago. But for us, we look at it, we look at, so 
obviously impact is very important for us, positive impact. But we have to take a step back, especially in an Asia context, and figure out what drives folks in this industry. And what drives folks in this industry, quite honestly, is cost. Everyone、mm. is very, very price sensitive. So it's really, it's really two things: is cost and then value, right? And in, and especially in this market where you've got higher interest rates, you've got supply chains which have been in flux and then only starting to normalize now. So you've got, you know, a lot of expense, additional expense on on that. You've got inflation, et cetera, et cetera. I think cost plays into this, you know, in in a much more important way. So. When we're looking at solutions, we want to understand how they can actually help a, a user's bottom line. I think that that's very important, and not help them in five years when they scale, but how can they help today? And I, and I think it's a bit of a Trojan horse, right? We have a interesting company called StructurePal that's、mm. that that has actually got a lot of a lot of pilots. It's actually been one of the easiest technologies to sell in, to be to be honest. And the reason for that is that obviously they have a massive positive impact. Through the rationalization of use of materials, but also they also have an incredible cost benefit. So you know they can decrease costs by up to fifteen percent. So that's that that makes a lot of real estate investors and developers and construction companies very excited. So I think this is one question I probably should also ask you since I just asked you about the trades in startup founders. If I reverse the question, what are the red flags that would deter you from investing in them? I think if a technical founder, and we've had this right, and I'm being very generalist here because often these rules don't apply sometimes. But、mm. I think for me, I get nervous about a big team of founders. So when there's four or five founders, especially if they're all technical, you know that 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 worries me. I think that if a founder, I mean, a founder needs to have a, a business plan and stick to it, right? They need to be very, very. I guess they need to back themselves up. So, but at the same time, I think they also need to listen. Whether they take, whether they take that advice or criticism and 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 apply it is different. But if they're willing to listen, I think that that's important and really listen and understand another point of view. It's up to them what they do with that. I think that's super important. If someone's not willing to listen and and、uh, you know just says this way or the highway, then for me that's that's a big red flag. But but I think that you know I'm not so concerned about. Single founders, so a lot of people are. I, I, I sometimes think that that's can be a positive. I know that there's key man risk, but, but for me, it's about big founding teams. Sometimes that that worries me because I know how difficult it is with any business partnership. You know, it, again, this comes back to experience. When you've got multiple voices and multiple people, too many cooks, sometimes that can be an issue. So, you know, for me, it's about listening and also、uh, the makeup of the founding team. I probably would just say, when, even when I was in Warhub working with the startups that they are thinking or planning to invest, I think one of the first things we really look at is whether we can actually create a proof of concept with one of our teams within the company itself, and then obviously we also try to give help by also referring them to maybe players that maybe they may need their solution. So. I want to ask you, from your perspective, what's the type of help Undivided Ventures will actually provide for the startup teams? We talk about business model innovations, but I'm sure that there are a lot of other things that you can also help them with as well. Yeah, so so I mean, I think you brought up a good point, right? I mean, I think that again, a lot of these solutions have been built with no idea about where they're going to go. So, so you got some really interesting stuff, but. Then the founders like, okay, great. Where do I? How do I get into market? Right. So I think undivided with our network in Asia, especially. I mean, I think we can we can provide、uh, inroads to that at least to introduce folks to particular technologies and maybe have they have a proof of concept. It's really up to them、uh, after that as to whether they can demonstrate that this has use to the to the user. But also, I think it's on the sustainability side. So I think I alluded to it before, but we have a. Proprietary backend system where we actually measure reporting of our portfolio comp- companies on a quarterly basis, and they all they need to do is upload some of their impacts, and then our LPs can see this, you know, kind of in real time.、Mm. And I think what that does is that a it focuses these these companies, these portcos, even though some of them are early stage. On what is required moving forward. So as they evolve over time, whether they go into Series B, Series C, Series D, 
you know, that impact story is going to be much more important, that measurable impact. And they they will already have that at their fingertips. They will be able to demonstrate to any investor in the future, a more institutional investor, perhaps, or a larger investor where this becomes more and more important. This is what we've been doing over the life cycle. So actually sort of educating some of these port codes. Some of them are very educated and they know how to do this. Others need a bit more help. So even though they have a sustainability solution, they don't really know sometimes how to articulate that. And I think that that's where we, that's where we can really add value as well. You mentioned Structure Pell. It's a very interesting company that from Israel. Can you talk about other startups within the undivided uh, ventures uh, portfolio and also share their impact if everything goes right for them? Yeah, so I mean, as as a fund, we we have a high level go- impact goals, right? And then we break it down, as I said, over individual porcos. So uh, there's a company called Clean Robotics, which we invested in. And if you just look at some of the numbers, we believe over a nine year period. So just like underwriting, we underwrite impact too. So when we're looking at uh, Clean Robotics, we feel that you know they could do uh, nine megatons of of carbon abatement and 169 million tons of diversion of waste. So Clean Robotics is basically a ro- robot solution that operates in high density areas at the point of disposal. So one of the biggest issues with with waste diversion is that you know if you have these waste bins which say glass plastic, et cetera, a lot of the time human beings are quite lazy and they just throw it wherever they can. And what this bin does is using AI and machine learning, it essentially, whatever you throw in there, it will actually separate at point of disposal. And that becomes much more easy for the prop- property owner to then you know, send it to the recycling center. And then it becomes much more easily for the recycling center to sort and, and recycle those that that way. So I think that's super interesting. We just invested in uh, what I think is the next phase of sustainability, which is around nature. We invest in a company called Gentian IO. And mm. what Gentian does is they they fall into our nature positive investment theme. And 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 they essentially look at you know urban landscapes, urban green roofs, rural landscapes, and they map out you know climate issues around habitat. And I think that you know moving forward, when we have uh, further requirements around nature reporting, so today we have a lot of rep- requirements around carbon. In Europe, we, we're starting to get a lot of requirements around nature. I think that's going to become very, very important. And and you know we feel for for Ge- for Gentian, they can have a positive effect on nature of up to you know 4.3 million hectares of of land, including in in urban areas, over the next nine years, which I think again is going to be super, super important. And we're looking at somewhere like Singapore, which is you know a really real urban ecosystem actually in terms of biodiversity. I think that's going to be very important to those particular cities in 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 Asia and and also somewhere like Hong Kong as well, which is which is also fairly biodiverse. So what's the one thing you know about investing in companies that operate in the built environment that very few people do? I, I think we've touched on it. I don't know whether I know anything that no one else knows, but what I will say is that it's very hard to get these companies into uh, businesses. So that's the downside, right? So if you don't work with, if you're investing in a company as an individual angel, you better be sure that you're investing with other strategics because Otherwise, this company is going to go nowhere, in my opinion, right? If they don't have a way into construction companies and developers, it's going to be very, very tough. But I also think that, you know, moving forward, there will be an increasing amount of demand for this technology because a lot of real estate owners, whether they like to admit it or not, are actually quite scared. They're they're actually quite scared about the valuation impact this could have on their vast portfolios. And I think that if you touch on that fear and you can relate it back to valuation and cost, like we've we've spoken about, I think that ticks a lot of boxes. So the sustainability piece is obviously very important, but treat it a bit like a Trojan horse, right? Treat it like mm. this way of getting into into these into these businesses. And I think that that's that's a that's a super important thing for a startup to 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 focus on. So do you have any advice for startups, entrepreneurs looking to make a positive impact on the built environment, sustainability? I mean, they are actually tackling very, very big problems like reducing carbon emissions and improving building towards achieving net zero. These are not easy goals, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think a couple of things, right? So first of all, pick your market, right? And and understand where that market's at. So if you go to Europe today, the idea of ESG is 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 sort of gone, right? I mean, ESG really is just a reporting mechanism. What what people in Europe are now looking at is they're looking at nature, they're looking at carbon, obviously, biodiversity, et cetera, and wondering what the measurable impact is. So if you're a real estate developer, you really have to prove out what your measurable impact is in, in these different areas. If you look at Asia, I think there are markets today that 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 are about data collection or about sort of benchmarking, right? Because if we don't understand where we are, we're never going to understand where we need to get to. So if you're a company looking at data in particular segments and and retrieval of that data i think that that's still an interesting area to be in in an asian an asian concept but i think most importantly i think go to networking events if you can go to things like you know cbre jll all this stuff where you can kind of meet people and and understand where the pain points are go to lectures right go go to uli has has a has has a lot of lecture series where you can understand where people are looking at because again i think it comes back to there's no point in spending years and years of your life building something which really doesn't have a huge amount of demand it may be really interesting but if there's no demand you're not going to get to that next stage and you won't be able to prove out your thesis so i think finding out if there's a market is is key I'm getting to the part of the conversation that I really enjoyed, I think, during that dinner conversation we had, which is basically talking about technologies and what are their role in the built environment and specifically bringing out the most significant potential that in the areas that you invest in. So I'm going to start off with the most obvious one, which is artificial intelligence and generative AI. You and I have some thoughts on that, but I want to hear what you have to say because it's very intellectually interesting. You know, it's 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 funny, right? Because AI, as you know, has been around a while, but it's only been in the last, I guess, almost twelve months, right? Since ChatGPT and 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 everyone's starting to talk about AI. But modeling, you know, traditional AI has been around a, a long time, and that's why data has has been so important for ages. I, you know, I have to say, on the whole, so we do life cycle analysis on buildings, and 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 also as as my business partner, technical partner, Dr. Tim Foreman always says sustainability is a case of trade-offs, right? That you're mm-hmm. never going to find that pure solution. I think AI on the whole, and and I'll just talk about traditional AI for a second. I think AI has huge amounts of benefit when it comes to climate. Because if you're looking at research, I think that there's so much research on climate, there's so much research on technologies around climate, but it would take years and years and years and years and years for just individuals to really disseminate what that information means. So I think that that can be a massive benefit. I think if AI is used well and the data that goes in and the research that goes in is good, then we could come to some conclusions much more quickly. And if you if you look at it, we are in a race against time, right? Climate, uh, this climate challenge is, is the biggest challenge of our generation, I think, and, and maybe unfortunately even our children's generation. So, so I think AI can prove provide a really interesting pathway to that. As far as generative AI is concerned, I think the jury's still out. Mm. I mean, I think I think that I actually don't really have an answer there. I, I don't have a conclusive answer. You can obviously visualize how that could work in a very positive way, but I certainly haven't seen anything yet that makes me believe today that it's it's going to be super, super useful where we are today. But again, this stuff mm. moves so quickly that the jury's out. I think there's a negative though on all this stuff, mm. right? And the negative is that data <laughs> requires energy to process. Data centers are growing like crazy. I heard recently the Microsoft Copilot is actually delayed because they just can't get enough data centers or uh, enough capacity. I think Singapore is almost tapped out in terms of you know, actual power that's needed for these data centers. So it's going to be very difficult to build more data centers in Singapore. And 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 also I heard from a data center uh, a developer the other day that Hong Kong and Singapore are actually the perfect places for data centers in terms of serving the wider Asia region. So unless we also develop innovative solutions to decarbonize data centers, to reduce energy uh, on data centers, I think that's also a big, big philosophical issue that we need to well, not just philosophical it's also a big climate issue that we need to solve for so you know it's a double-edged sword right yeah that's the spot on part that i think a lot of people don't appreciate about what 
doing AI is about. But another area of interest, I think people have actually gone hypes and down cycles is the internet of things. Maybe we can cut it down to mostly sensors, information, interaction within environments. Where do you see that going in the internet of things? Yeah, I mean, I think that the IoT senses is pretty old school, you know, and, and you know, when it's looking at energy, right? And I think we've been doing this for years. I think buildings in the future, if you don't have some of those sensors already built into your development plans, then, you know, that's a bit nuts. I, I, what I'm interested in, though, is how people use space. And I think that comes down to social value. I think that often what where IoT can provide really, really in, interesting insights is you know how people actually circulate in space. So when I was a developer, it was very unilateral. I would sit down with a designer and we'd decide how space is how space is built, what color walls there are, what you know where the furniture is going. I think that's super old school, super inefficient. I think you know in the future, I think when when we're able to visualize through sensors and movement on on how people use space, I think that's going to provide us really interesting insight on how we can better design space. And that leads back to social value and how people use, uh, how people can use office space, for example, when people come into work, because, you know, maybe not so much in Asia, but definitely in Europe, people are using the office a little less than they they were pre-pandemic. So I I think that's where IoT for me is interesting. I think energy sensors, IAQ, et cetera, is obviously uh, something that will be here to stay, but I don't think it's particularly revolutionary today when, when we look at it. How about blockchain technologies? I think we're not talking about Web3 and crypto trading. I think we're really specifically talking about that area where I think now there's a lot of efforts going into what's called real-world asset monetization. Yeah, I mean, I think blockchain is the essential but kind of boring part of where we can inventorize and, and actually look at scope three emissions, right? Because scope mm-hmm. three is if for a lot of developers even is one of the biggest areas um, that they need to tackle. You know, where is my, wh- wh- looking at supply chains, you know, wh- where where are these materials I'm building this development coming from, right? I mean, everyone's talking about timber and how amazing timber is, but, you know, how is that timber cultivated? Where is it shipped from? You know, et cetera, et cetera. And I think blockchain can provide a really interesting audit trail around that and provide, you know, kind of, you know, a really interesting pathway to to solving some of those scope three issues when it comes to supply chain. But again, I think the blockchain also requires a lot of uh, a lot of power and 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 that's another issue, right? So so but you know, I mean I think again, you know, blockchain can can be very, very useful, especially when it looks at you know waste and on construction sites, mm-hmm. you know, which we've seen a lot of use use cases for, et cetera. Mm. That also with now the proof of work change to proof of stake and also a lot of what is called that level two change that's specific for Ethereum, the energy problem is going to go down. But let's go to somewhere more conservative, like, well, not very conservative, but augmented and virtual reality. I know we have the Apple Vision Pro and, you know, tons of metaverse stuff, but in built environments, extremely useful because it's about visualizing your surroundings and the impact. So where, where do you think that is going? Yeah. So, I mean, I think on construction sites, for example, one of the biggest issues today, not just in, you know, Saudi Arabia or the Middle East, but also in Singapore and Hong Kong is, is worker safety, right? And, and, you know, it, it, again, for us, it falls within that social value investment theme. We, we met a really interesting company the other day that talked about using augmented reality to look at pitfalls on construction sites. So where people might have injuries wearing a certain goggles or glasses can actually help identify through some infrared technology some of the areas which can be a real problem on construction sites. I also think that from a sustainability perspective, it helps to reduce the amount of interventions. So retrofits Mm. are a really focus area for mature cities. So mature cities, again, in Asia context like Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, I think there's going to continue to be a lot of retrofits moving forward. I think understanding where uh, through through a combination of augmented reality and BIM, you know where a lot of the M and E building services are. You know how 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 we can use existing infrastructure within the building to to reposition the asset. I think through augmented reality is going to be going to be super super interesting. I think it is old school and and it's been around a long time, but I think people are taking it to the next level now, and we're seeing some really interesting applications. And I also think one of the biggest 
issues with technology and construction especially is it's great if the C-level suite or C-suite say, okay, great, guys, let's let's go and use this technology. But if you don't get buy-in from the workers on site, from those people actually using it, it's it's pointless, right? And so I think sort of if we can provide a way for these folks to more easily use this technology, and that comes through some of the ways like goggles and and w- whatever company is producing this stuff and it's 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 very easy to be to to make this intervention happen i think that's going to really really help so i'm excited about some of that hardware that's coming out as well and how that's going to make it more accessible to to those workers the last area i think that's actually the most interesting is actually advancements in say material science and engineering sciences this is where i think you also intersected with most, a lot of founders working in this space where do you think that for that area of technology, how do you see that in the built environment? Because that's actually where you're closest to. So this is the area that I'm like super interested in. Because I think that I think if we can solve for materials, then we've almost solved, I would say, 70% of the problem. I mean, I think SaaS solutions are fantastic for data collection, understanding where the problem is. And in some cases, you know, having a transitionary impact. So, you know really looking at what we can do from a so if you've got an inventory of, of thousands and thousands of materials right really understanding through ai and 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 some saas solutions what the best materials to use in a particular site are in a particular development i think is very interesting so again that technology is going to be super useful moving forward but i think that ultimately it's the materials itself which are going to change the game right so if we can find you know 8% of all emissions today come from come from concrete if mm. we can find a solution through not just re- recycling i mean a lot of people are doing recycling into you know bricks and 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 things like that i have to say i'm not super interested in that because i think the 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 method of recycling also produces a lot of carbon number one and then also we're all almost saying to folks okay it's okay to use all these plastics etc because ultimately we'll recycle them you know mm. I, that's not the case, right? We all know that 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 there there is an end of life to everything. So, if you're recycling into a, into a, into a block or a block work, etc., you're eventually going to have to dispose of that through demolition. So, that carbon will be released at some point in time. I think biomaterials and you know lab grown materials around insulations, around concrete, mm. around you know all this stuff for us is fascinating. Having said that, it's super difficult to invest in because, and you can totally understand this. If you're a building department, you know, in Singapore or Hong Kong or wherever in Asia, and you actually generally want to have an alternative, but you need data and that data takes a long time. You're not going to allow someone to build a building using this new biomaterial to put up structural walls and columns. You're, you're going to be worried about the safety of the people using that asset. So, you know, that retrieving that data, getting it approved, I think is going to take a while. Mm. And the other thing with materials, I think is, which I think is super important is we don't change the way that we build. So if the material requires a fundamental shift in how contractors are building, I think for us, that's also a bit of a boo-boo and a bit of a no-no because Mm. again, it's trying to get buy-in from these contractors. It's trying to get buy-in from their workers on site. If you're changing the game for these guys, it's going to become very, very difficult. And when you're operating as a contractor on very thin margins, like, you know, Mm. you know, any, anything that just potentially disrupts that, you know, I think is pretty scary. Right. And so I, I think that, I think for us, it's about the method statement on how that, on how that material is applied to, to any given site. And one interesting part, which just now we talk about in AI, I think bringing AI, for example, AlphaFold is finding the right protein target for pharmaceuticals. At some point, we should probably see the same approach goes to material science where the AI can actually generate all the configurations to test for. I, I did my material science in my, in my first degree, so I know how painful it is to test material like a hundred times just on, on how many configurations. It's almost a trial and error, but I think yeah, now we abs- are in, in that timing to do that absolutely and you know we talked about this right before i think what's really interesting we we have bim technologies we've got digital twins we got we got ai you know you can construct a building today 
virtually and test out all these different configurations and see what what works, not just from a, a sustainability perspective, but also what's the best structural integrity of the combination of these materials. And I think that that is super interesting. I think that any technology that's able to do that and that's out there today and listening to this, please get in touch with me because I think that I think that that for us, if you can model that out in in a concise way, but what that does take is it, you need to have that data. You need to have understand what is out there in the marketplace. You know what materials are available, what that combination might look like. So you know, I think any company doing that needs to needs to have a pretty good handle on the on 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 what's out, what the what the ecosystem looks like today. Mm, I think the also challenge is in the business model for this kind of company because the question is whether you want to be an arm to license off the chipset or do you have to go full vertical integration where you have to build out their material and then license the intellectual property, which also put you in the crosshairs of a lot of material, big materials company, just like the farmers. That's why you don't see Google's showing up in the pharmaceuticals because when they get big enough, they they have been absorbed into the big four of farmers, right? Yeah, and I, and I mean, I think it happens with materials, right? I mean, all these big cement and concrete companies, they are fairly notorious for seeing what what seems to be getting traction, buying that company out, and then kind of putting it in a drawer somewhere. But I, I do think that those concrete companies are changing, right? If you look mm. at Semex, you know, Semex Ventures, I think they're pretty pretty forward thinking in in how they're looking at this space. I think they you know, like a lot of, I guess, oil companies, right? That they're, they're, they're seeing that that the writing is on the wall in many respects. It's just how long it takes for us to get there. And I think if they don't invest in innovation today, then you know, there's a there's potentially a business issue moving forward. So I think the the forward think forward looking ones are really kind of exploring this innovation in a genuine way. So my traditional closing question: What does great look like for undivided ventures? So I think that this is a really, really unique time in history where we can genuinely invest in something we care about, which hopefully all of us care about the planet. And at the same time, we can make money doing so. It's very rare that those th- two things collide. You, there's usually a trade-off, right? So what 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 great looks like for Undivided Ventures is the the ability to actually invest at scale. Right and invest in solutions that can scale impact, scaling impact beyond what what where we are today, and and working with almost every portfolio in Asia, in some way to provide solutions that meet those impact requirements and and go beyond just ESG reporting. We you know how how can we really have how can we bring back you know the climate to where we want it to be? How can we really sort of meet these sustainability goals? I think for us, that's super, super important. And at the same time, we, we fiduciaries of capital is 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 really making money for our, for our LPs. And I think, again, this is a really interesting time to do that. We're, we've got a lot of headwinds with capital markets the way they are with, with geopolitics in the world. But at the end of the day, I think no one would disagree that you know we only have one planet right and as cliche as cheesy mm. as that sounds you know and until we until we all want to immigrate to mars you know i think we're we've got to make we've got to make this planet work and and i think it's essentially about that and we can only do that at scale alex many thanks for coming on the show so in closing i have two quick questions for you any recommendations that have recently inspired your life my life you know again this sounds maybe a little little bit bit cheesy but my kids actually because in kids you see hope right and and I know that a lot of people say that but unless you take time to 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 really watch them grow and develop I think you know we all want to do this for our children we all want to leave a better place than what we had for our children so for me my children really really inspire me and 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 help help me move forward with what I'm doing because it's not easy sometimes right I mean you know, you're you're trying to tackle a massive problem in a very very difficult industry, and I think you've always got to remember why you're doing that. So, so you know, for me, it's 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 my kids that over over the last few months have really been giving me a lot of inspiration. Mm. How can my audience find you? So you can easily reach out to me at alex at undivided.vc. You know, get in touch anytime. As I said, you know, we we want to build an ecosystem here. We want to build an ecosystem 
of people wanting to achieve the same things as us. And I don't think there's any competition right now. I think everyone needs to work together in an undivided way to really tackle these problems. So, you know, really happy to receive anyone's anyone's emails and, and please do reach out. Mm. So best of luck and of hopefully get the whole fund uh, raised. And I look forward to see more interesting investments coming from your portfolio. And when you're popping by in Singapore, please let me know and we can go out and have a drink as well. Awesome. Uh, for, awesome. For, for everyone, uh, you can actually subscribe to us at YouTube and basically at every uh, podcast platform. And of course, subscribe to us at Asia newsletter. So many thanks for coming on the show, Alex. And I look forward to speak to you again. Thanks, Bernard. Thanks for having me.